Nobody like our God. Nobody. Nobody like our God. No other gods can compare to the one and only true God. Nobody no one like our God. And that's what we're going to sing this morning. There is nobody like our God. None sits higher and looks low. None can do the things that our mighty God can do. So we praise him and we thank him. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name. Your name is strength. Your name is power. A strong tower makes me say. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, 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 how excellent, how excellent name is your name. Your name is strength. Your name is strength. Your name is power. Your name is power. A strong tower. A strong tower makes me say.
There's nobody like your love, nobody like your love, and we're crying out. Wherever you are, um, especially if you're in the sanctuary today, you ought to be uh, putting your hands together uh, and blessing the Lord uh, for uh, the spirit that has moved through the praise team on today. Uh, now, as always, uh, I come before you in the name of Yahweh, uh, for his name alone is excellent uh, and his glory is above the earth and the heavens. Uh, all power and all authority uh, has he given unto his son, Yeshua, whom we call Jesus. And it's through the Holy Spirit that we will exalt him today. Therefore, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and redeemer. Um, it's certainly my good pleasure uh, to come um, before you again uh, on this good Sabbath uh, afternoon. Uh, again, for those of you who I have not met, my name is Renee Cannon, uh, and I am the pastor of the Bethany and Calvary Seventh-day Adventist Churches, uh, which are located in Charlottesville and Gordonsville, Virginia, respectively, and nestled within the comfortable confines of the Great Allegheny West Conference. Um, as always, it is a privilege uh, to be able to fellowship uh, and worship with the Berean Seventh-day Adventist Church, especially any time uh, that I'm able to come under the invitation of our pastor, uh, Pastor T. Ron Wegar. Uh, I've come under Pastor Wegar's mentorship uh, about 10 years ago, uh, and I've been able to walk with him aside uh, by side. I was baptized by Pastor Wegar. Uh, I was given my first ministerial assignments uh, and, and, and able to preach uh, in nursing homes uh, by Pastor Wegar. Uh, Pastor Wegar, he ordained me as a local elder uh, at the Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, and he's walked with me every single step of the way, uh, even helping me to write my first sermon. Uh, and that was 10 years ago, but uh, even though he helped me to write my first sermon 10 years ago, uh, I'm not ashamed to admit that Pastor Wegar is still helping me along to this very day. Uh, and if you could ever have told me back then uh, that, that, that one day uh, Pastor Wegar would introduce me and have me to, to preach uh, for him, I would have considered it to be a lie. Uh, but now I look at it and I see it as a great honor and a privilege uh, to stand behind the desk in Pastor Wegar stead. And I thank you again uh, for your mentorship, uh, for your leadership, both in my life and as well uh, as the lives of the many others that you minister to. Uh, the song that the praise team sang uh, was such a timely song, uh, especially in dealing with our text. Um, last night we began uh, this mini series in looking at the glimpses from the life of David, uh, and 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 we started off uh, looking at this battle, uh, 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 which would really shape uh, the faith and the life of of David, uh, and show you where his power came from. Uh, uh, we determined last night that the power that David possessed uh, it came because he had been anointed with the oil. Uh, somebody ought to say Amen today. Uh, 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 and, and the fact that he had the oil meant that the presence of God was working and moving in his life. And today we want to move forward to our second glimpse. Uh, uh, and that second glimpse is found in the eighth division of the Psalms. Uh, so if you got your Bibles, I'm encouraging you to open them uh, to Psalm 8. And we want to look at verse 0 all the way through 9. Psalm 8, verse 0 
all the way through verse nine. I'm reading in your hearing from the King, the new King James version of the Bible, Psalms chapter eight, verse zero, all the way through nine. Verse zero begins to the chief musician yes, sir. on the instrument of Gad, yes, a Psalm of David. And then he says, oh, Lord, our Lord. How excellent is your name in all the earth, uh, who have set your glory above the heavens. Yeah. He says, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. He says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man? that you are mindful of him, and the son of man, that you should visit him. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, uh, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. Oh, Yahweh, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And uh, I just want to pull my title from verse zero. Uh, our title and topic this, this afternoon is Upon the Instrument of Gath. Uh, Upon the Instrument of Gath. Yes, sir. Now, since my adolescence, or from my developmental years, I've always had a love for music. And, 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 and what I love most about music is the lyrical composition of the song. Uh -huh. uh, for Pastor Wegard, the lyrics of a song, uh, they have the power to transport the listener uh, from their current situation uh, into the mind of the writer. Yes, uh, the lyrics of a song, uh, help the listener to understand what love is as well as what it ain't. Mm -hmm. uh, the lyrics uh, help the listener intellectually comprehend the struggles that the writer had to overcome and the methods by which they overcame them. The, the lyrics of a song are important because they offer us a glimpse into the mind of the writer. That's right. Uh, yet while the lyrics are an imperative and indispensable part of the song, the lyrics aren't all that is needed to make good music. Um, uh, for the likability of a song is, is often determined by the ability to blend good lyrics uh, with beautiful instrumentation. Uh, for while the lyrics of a song are able to engage the mind, brothers and sisters, it is the instrument that is able to embrace the heart. Uh, come on, somebody. Uh, uh, see, the lyric helps you to perceive what love is, uh, but the instrument helps you to feel the rush of the first touch uh, and the pain of when it is stripped away. It is the lyric that helps you to understand the struggle of the writer, but it is the instrument that allows you to experience the desperation of hope and the relief of victory as well as the anguish of defeat. For it is the lyric that engages the mind uh, while the instrument embraces the heart. And, and, and today I believe that it is the instrument that is oftentimes missing from our worship experience. For we are able to intellectually understand the doctrines, but we are not able to feel what God is saying to us within our hearts. Uh, and that's why the word of God God is so significant for us on today because the text of meditation is calling our attention back to the instrument which embraces the heart. Uh, we see this in verse zero of Psalm eight, uh, where the Bible declares that David was playing this song upon the instrument of Gath. 
Uh, now, while unknown to contemporary society, uh, this particular instrument of gath is thought by ancient Near Eastern archaeologists to be a wooden stringed instrument that resembles the modern guitar. And this instrument was said to be native to the Philistine city of Gath. Uh, uh, and the fact that David played the Lord's song upon a Philistine's instrument ought to raise some eyebrows in this place today, uh, especially considering the fact that the Philistines were known to be an aggressive and warlike people with age-old hostilities toward the Israelite people. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, one of the earliest encounters with the Philistines take place uh, shortly after the Israelites were liberated from Egyptian captivity. Uh, for the Bible tells us that while leading the people to the Red Sea uh, uh, in Exodus 13 and 17, uh, uh, it says that God did not lead the people straight to the Red Sea, but instead he took them around about on a scenic route. And the reason that he took them on this alternative path instead of going directly to the Red Sea is because God did not want the Israelites to pass through the way of the land of the Philistines. For God knew that the Philistines were exceedingly violent and that they would have slaughtered the defenseless Israelites had they crossed their paths. Mm -hmm. uh, later in Israelite history, the Bible records several skirmishes between the Israelites and the Philistines, uh, one of which culminated or climaxed with the Philistines actually defeating the Israelites and confiscating the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the literal presence of Yahweh. Uh, therefore, the Bible is telling us that this instrument finds its origins in enemy territory amongst the aggressive and warlike people of Philistines. Uh, perhaps exacerbating this issue is the fact that in addition to this, this instrument came from perhaps the most violent city of all of Philistia, which is called Gath. Uh, and the reason that I say that Gath was the most violent city of all of Philistia is because Gath was home to the gigantic warrior that we talked about all last night, uh, who is called Goliath. Um, uh, uh, this is the same one that defied and disrespected the armies of the Lord. And, and if you were to read further about this city of Gath in the Bible, uh, you find that the Bible tells us that there were also other men of gigantic stature that were ready and willing to capture and kill the Israelites. Mm -hmm. Yet despite this city's reputation for violence and open hostility towards the Israelites, verse zero of the text tells us that David played this psalm upon the instrument of Gath, um, uh, which causes us to question uh, how David even got his hands upon this instrument in the first place. Uh, understanding that the Philistines would have uh, wanted to kill him, how is it that David plays this song upon the infidel's instrument oh. uh, in uncovering the method by which David obtained the instrument of Gath? Uh, the scripture provides us no context, um, uh, and the academic Bible scholars supply us with no explanation. Uh, in such an undertaking, uh, we are left to our own devices and our study of the Bible. Uh, and through my investigation of the scripture, uh, I believe the Spirit has led me to come uh, to the personal opinion that uh -huh. David most likely obtained this instrument when Israel, under his leadership, conquered the Philistines and captured the city of Gath. Uh -huh. uh, this event is recorded in the 18th chapter of 1 Chronicles. Uh, there, the Bible says that David smote the Philistines and took over the city of Gath. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, the Bible says that he looted the city of all of their valuables. Um, uh, uh, from those he conquered, the Bible says that he took uh, chariots, horsemen, uh, foot soldiers, silver, gold, brass, and other pre precious valuables. And it's from these spoils of war that I believe that David obtained this instrument of Gath. And in my mind's eye, yes, I, I can almost see David back at his palace, uh, sorting through some of the goods that he had plundered. 
Uh, I can see David admiring his new fleet of chariots. Uh, uh, I can see him gazing upon uh, uh, his precious metals and envisioning what they be, might be melted down and used for. When out of the corner of his eye, a dusty brown instrument caught his attention. Uh -huh. uh, and David, being a musician, uh, felt drawn or pulled to this instrument. Uh, I can see him raising himself up from his throne, uh, walking over to this heap of loot and removing the clutter from the top of the instrument. Uh, uh -huh. Once David had the instrument in, in his hands, uh, the first thing he did was blow it and a, a, a plume of white dust formed a cloud above where he had blew. Yes, uh, I can see David uh, strumming his fingers across the strings of the instrument. And when he heard the sweet sound that bounced off its wooden body, David's heart began to dance to the rhythm of the beat. Uh, David then reached into his pocket and grabbed himself a cloth and began to clean this instrument, uh, wiping away the dirt and debris from its past that it might be prepared for its new use in the presence. I wish somebody was listening today. Uh, and as David wiped the instrument, uh, I can see him thinking of some of the things that the instrument might have been used for when it was in the hands of the Philistines. Uh, for in the hands of the Philistines, it might have been used to lead their troops in to war against the Israelites, thus providing rhythm for the marching boots of the Philistines and the soundtrack of certain death and terror for the Israelites. Uh, in the hands of the Philistines, uh, its streams might have strummed the national anthem of an oppressive and corrupt nation and been used to serenade its, cr serenade its crooked leaders. Uh, in the hands of the Philistines, this instrument might have been used to arouse the attention of the Philistine deity. Dagon and to worship other false gods um, uh, in the hands of the Philistines. This instrument might have been used at parties in which drunken and drug induced men and women defiled themselves from nightfall into sunrise. Uh -huh. uh, uh, hands of the Philistines. This instrument might have been used for any manner of evil. Uh, but now the instrument was in David's hands. And, and, and what David was poised to teach us this morning is that the quality of music that an instrument plays is all dependent upon whose hands the instrument is in. Uh, are you following me on today? Uh, you see a trumpet in my hands. Uh, uh, ain't nothing but a funny looking piece of metal, uh, but a trumpet in Louis Armstrong's hands uh, makes this place a wonderful world. Uh, a piano in my hands uh, might get you chopsticks at its best, uh, but a piano underneath Stevie Wonder's hands uh, will get you a ribbon in the sky. Uh, a, a microphone in my hands uh, might clear the room if I start singing, but a microphone in Beyonce's hands uh, will sell out every stadium in the city. Uh, that's because the quality of music Music that an instrument plays is all dependent upon the hands that is in. That's right. The Apostle Paul even acknowledges this if you can't hear it today. Uh, for in the book of Romans, in, in chapter 6 and verse 13, uh, he tells us not to yield our bodies as instruments of unrighteousness unto uh -huh. sin, uh, but that we should rather yield ourselves as instruments of righteousness unto God. Um, thus Paul was saying that as long as we are instruments in the hands of the devil, uh, we're going to play the tunes of racism and sexism. Uh, as long as we're in the devil's hands, um, yeah. we'll play the tune of gossip and backbiting. Uh, as uh -huh. long as we're in the devil's hands, uh, we'll play the tune of division, manipulation, and unforgiveness. Those are the tunes that we will play when we're in the devil's hands. Uh, however, in God's hands, uh, you play the tune of purity, integrity, and equality. Uh, in God's hands, you play the tune of reconciliation and forgiveness. Uh, in God's hands, uh, you love your enemies and bless those that curse you. You show love to your haters and, and you pull your persecutors. In God's hands, uh, you'll be an instrument that plays a brand new song and sings a brand new tune. Uh, oh, y'all don't hear me preaching today. Uh, for you used to sing uh, Between the Sheets, uh, but now you sing He Hideth Me uh, in the Cleft of the Rock. Uh, you used to sing uh, The Boy is Mine, but, but now you sing Blessed Assurance of 
Jesus is mine. You used to sing up, back that thing up, but now you sing, draw me nearer, blesses Lord, to your precious bleeding side, because in God's hands, you're an instrument that will play a brand new song and sing a brand new to somebody out to worship him on today. And that's what's happening in this text. Bridge! For the instrument of Gath had gone from being uh, uh, in the hands of the Philistines uh, uh, to being in the hands of David, a man after God's own heart. And while the instrument had previously been used for all manner of wickedness, David was going to turn around and use it for righteousness. Uh, and with the instrument of Gath in his hands, uh, 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 its strings being strung beneath his fingertips, uh, the text tells us uh, that the first thing that David does is sing about God's excellence. Uh, uh, we find that in verse one, um, where David sings, oh, Yahweh, our Lord, um, how excellent is is your name in all the earth. Um, uh, and when David speaks of God's excellence, the first thing that he mentions is God's name. Uh, and the fact that he mentioned his name is critical uh, because all throughout the Bible, uh, God demands reverence and respect for his holy name. Uh, uh, for in those times, uh, a name was more than a verbal symbol of a person or a deity, uh, but a name uh, represented someone's reputation. Uh, you see, when God created man, uh, 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 the Bible tells us that he reached down into Adam or the dust of the ground. Uh, he formed him, shaped him, and called his name Adam. Thus, Adam's name uh, uh, means created from Adam or created from the very ground. Uh, uh, Eve's name uh, draws attention to the fact that she is the mother of the living. Uh, Abraham's name, uh, it means he is the father of uh, of the faithful. Moses means, oh, father of many nations, rather, Moses means uh, that he was drawn from the water. All of these people received their names based upon the reputations that they had. Uh, thus, when David declared that God's name is excellent throughout the earth, uh, what he was really saying is that God has an exemplary or exceptional reputation all throughout this planet. And I don't know about you this morning, uh, but but I affirm David's assessment of God's reputation. Uh, for God has shown up and shown out time and time again uh, in my own life. Um, uh, is there anybody else here that can testify that God's reputation is excellent? That yep. God kept you with a paycheck uh, in the midst of a pandemic, uh, that God kept you employed uh, when many people were getting laid off, uh, that God kept you from COVID when someone else in your house was infected, that God kept you alive uh, even though you were the one that caught it. Is there anybody here that, that, that can declare that God is a way maker, a miracle worker? Uh, he's a promise keeper and a light in the darkness, that God is a, a burden bearer and a heavy load sharer. Uh, he's a bridge over water, a doctor and a lawyer. He's yes. a friend to the friendless, a mother to the motherless. He's oh. bread when you're hungry. He's comfort when you're lonely. Oh, Lord, how excellent oh, is your name in all the earth. Uh, that's why we call you Jehovah Nisi, uh, the Lord my banner. Uh, uh, we call you Jehovah Ra'a, the Lord my shepherd. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Uh, Jehovah Shama, the Lord is present. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord my peace. Uh, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. Is there anybody here that can testify that God's name is excellent? Oh, Yahweh, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Oh, the earth. Bless his name. And here in the text, David is careful to let us know that God's excellence is not restricted or relegated to the earth, uh, but that his resplendency uh, uh, reaches beyond the heavens. So bless his name. We see that in section B of verse 1 where David declares that God's glory has been set above the heavens. Uh, uh, this Hebrew word that appears in the text in place of the word heavens uh, is the word uh, Hashemayim, and, and, and which is a plural noun. And the reason the word heavens does not appear in a singular form 
is because David is seeking to express the plurality of the locations that be, can be called heaven. Uh, this is important because in Hebrew thought, uh, there was said to be uh, three different heavens. And, and, and David is saying that God's glory is above every last one of them. Yes, uh, you got to hear me today. For the first heaven recognized in Hebrew thought is the sky. Uh, this is the place that eagles soar, that clouds uh, roam, and the raindrops fall. And the significance of God's glory being above this heaven is that many pagan worshipers believe that their gods live uh, in high places or mountains which stretch into the sky. But since God's glory is higher than the sky, uh, that means that he's greater than all these gods. Uh, uh, the second heaven uh, referred to the expanse that we call uh, uh, outer space. And, and, and back then, uh, there were some people that worshiped the stars, the, the, the constellations and stellar hosts. But, but, but since God's uh, glory is higher than outer space, uh, that means that he's also greater than those gods. Uh, now, the third heaven referred to the divine realm, uh, which was occupied by the angels and other celestial beings. And David is saying, uh, even though the angels are sacred, uh, even though they are altogether stunning and splendiferous, they are nothing in comparison to our God because God's glory uh, is above the heavens. And, and today that means uh, that there is no authority uh, that is higher than my God. Um, uh, neither is there any form of wisdom uh, that is higher than my God. Um, therefore, I don't care what a man or woman thinks about me uh, as long as I'm straight with my God. Um, I'm not concerned with what a politician says um, uh, if it ever contradicts my God. Um, I haven't lost hope because because of my diagnosis, I, I'm listening to my God. Uh, for there is neither man, woman, boy, girl, deity, or angel that is higher than my God. Uh, that's why the song says that the angels bow before him. Uh, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve for his glory is above the heavens. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Preach. And after proclaiming the excellence of God. David then uh, sings about the evidence of his excellence. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And in his explanation, he is saying that the way that God proves uh, his excellence is through the authority that he gives to humankind. Uh, we see this in the text first in verse two, where he says that humankind has been given the power over the enemy. Uh, for he says, out of the mouth of babes and, and, and nursing infants have you ordained strength uh, uh, in order that we might silence the enemy and the avenger. Uh, then continuing in verses five through eight, David then says, we have been given power over the entirety of the creation. Uh, for he writes, uh, uh, you have made humankind uh, uh, just a little lower than the angels, uh, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. He says, you have put all things under his feet, the, the sheep, the, the, the oxen, the beasts of the field, the, the, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea. Uh, in these verses, David is describing the dominion, the, 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 the power and authority that was given to man in the beginning of time. And he is saying that the evidence of God's excellence is this authority that he has granted onto humankind. Uh -huh. And if you just look at the world, you can obviously see this thing is true. Uh, for humankind domesticated the wolf and turned it into a dog. Uh, humankind uh, uh, is able to saddle the backs of even the most powerful of horses. Uh, humankind uh, ornaments aquariums with the most beautiful of fish. Um, we've made pets out of elephants and, and put the lion in the cage. Therefore, I must declare that it is true that humankind has been given authority over the entirety of the creation. And if I might parenthetically pause right now, I just want to say that if God has given you the power to subdue all of these things, then surely you've got the power to subdue procrastination. Uh, surely you can 
overcome some laziness. Uh, you can start that business. You can advance on that job. You can be the change that you need in the church uh, as well as the change that the entire world needs to see. Uh, for as the author Ellen White once said, uh, when the will of man cooperates with the will of God, yes, they become omnipotent. God has blessed you with the power to subdue the entire earth. That's right. Uh, yet despite of the tremendous blessing that has been afforded to man, David has a question for God. Uh, and you see this question in, in, in verse 4, where David asks, uh, 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 he says, God, uh, uh, what is man that you are mindful of him, uh, the son of man that you should visit him? Uh, and if you're tracking with me uh, 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 this afternoon, what David is asking is why would God give such a considerable prize to such a contemptible people? Or why would God give all this power to people that don't even deserve it? Oh, uh, y'all ain't hearing me on Zoom today. Uh, 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 but one thing that I've learned um, during my short stay on this earth is that people that don't act right um, don't deserve to be rewarded. Uh, uh, for when I was coming up, the reward for bad grades uh, was never a trip to the mall, uh, but the reward for bad grades at its best uh, uh, was the confiscation of entertainment uh, and the loss of privileges. Uh, uh, the reward for coming into late, in late to your job uh, uh, isn't more paid time off, uh, but the reward is being written up and you might find yourself being fired. Uh, the reward for committing a crime in the street isn't success, uh, but the reward is time in the county jail. Uh, yet this text seems to work counterintuitively uh, to all that we know about the relationship between behavior and reward. Uh, uh, for David is saying that God looks at people uh, that he knows are sinners and then he chooses to bless them in Anyway, uh, and therefore my question is, why does God bless people when he knows they don't deserve it? Why? Why, preacher? As we consider this quandary, I believe the answer to the question that David poses is found in the instrument uh, that he used to produce this very song. Uh, uh, for in, in David's hand, uh, uh, rested the instrument of Gath. Um, uh, and if you remember, uh, the instrument of Gath was not a righteous instrument. Um, uh, uh, if you remember, uh, the instrument of Gath uh, uh, was an instrument that was likely used to lead Philistine troops into battle. Uh, uh, the instrument of Gath uh, uh, was likely used in uh, uh, debauchery and reverie, uh, uh, in the worship of pagan deities. But now the instrument of Gath was being used to exalt the name of the Lord, um, uh, which says to us um, uh, that God's excellence is exhibited uh, uh, when he takes an instrument of the enemy uh, and transforms it into an instrument of the Lord. And, uh, and this reality uh, ought to help you to change the way you look at people. Uh, but when you look at people, uh, you shouldn't just see them for who they are, uh, but you should see them for what they should be or could be. Uh, yeah, you might think your kids are lazy right now. Uh, you might look at them and just see a waste of potential. Uh, but with the right motivation, uh, they could be the leaders in this church and leaders in this community and successful in their careers. Uh, your children can be uh, uh, instruments of Lord, um, when you see brother or sister so-and-so, uh, uh -huh. you might see someone that has a nasty attitude and yeah. an unwelcoming spirit, uh, but God is able to take them in his hands and uh, transform them into evangelists. Uh, they yeah. too can be uh, instruments of the Lord. Um, you might have a power-hungry boss, um, uh, some yeah. messy co-workers and uh, a spouse that won't come to church. Um, you might have nieces and nephews that won't stay out of jail. Uh, you might know uh, uh, some drunks, some addicts, and some promiscuous folk, uh, but you shouldn't look down on them 
because God is able to take an instrument of the enemy and turn it into an instrument of the Lord. Um, and if you don't believe me this morning, uh, just look at what he did with the cross. Um, uh, for the cross was an instrument of, uh, of suffering and shame. Uh, uh, the cross was an instrument of torture and torment, of brutality and barbarity. Uh, the cross humiliated and humbled its victims. Uh, the cross exposed people uh, in the presence of their loved ones. Um, uh, the cross was used uh, to silence the incarnate word of God. Um, the cross was used uh, uh, to incapacitate the king of kings and crucify the Lord of lords. Uh, the yeah. cross was the instrument uh, that was used to kill Jesus. Um, there was nothing good about the cross. Um, there was nothing sacred about its splinters or special about its nails. But, but yeah. God took the cross um, that which was intended for evil and he turned it around for good um, God took the cross um, that was meant to kill and he made it the means for eternal life. Um, God took the instrument of the enemy and transformed it into an instrument of the Lord. Uh, therefore, the cross is the instrument of my salvation. Um, the cross is a symbol of God's sacrifice. The cross is a sign of God's love. Um, the cross is the atonement of my sins. The cross says God can take that which was bad and turn it around for good. Uh, the cross says he can take a sinner uh, and he can turn them into a saint. Uh, the uh -huh. cross says he can take the evil and turn them to evangelists. The uh -huh. cross says the pernicious can even become preachers. Uh, the former promiscuous, they can even become pastors. Uh, drunks can become deacons and yeah, 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 can be yeah. Christians. The cross says he can take an instrument of the enemy and turn it into an instrument of of the Lord. Uh, that's why we sing at the cross, at the cross uh, where I first saw the light uh, and the burden of my heart is rolled away. Uh, it was there by faith that I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. I wish I had two or three folk right now that just, just celebrate for the fact that God took an instrument of the enemy and he turned it into an instrument of the Lord. Somebody say yes. Yes. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. In the second glimpse of David's life, mm. what we find from Psalm 8 is that God was able to take this instrument of the enemy, the instrument of Gath, yes. and use it for his glory. Mm -hmm. And what that says to us today is no matter what it is, that you've been through prior to today. No matter what it is that you've been known for in the street, uh, no matter what it is that they used to call you uh, uh, 20 years ago for the things that you used to do, God is still able to take you and use you for his glory. Somebody's here and they need to submit to that will and where you've been burdened uh, uh, by your own guilt uh, today. Uh, uh, you felt for, for long enough uh, that you would never uh, be good enough to be used by Christ. And the truth is none of us will ever be good enough, but God out of his mercy and his grace will use us anyway. You need to let go today and you are looking to commit your life to Christ. Uh, I just want you to write within our comments, uh, uh, send an in inbox, a text, do whatever you have to do to reach out to the Berean Seventh-day Adventist Church and let them know that you're ready to commit. Just like last time, I also make the appeal for that individual that needs to recommit. Uh, perhaps you've been watching uh, 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 and you know uh, that it's time to, to, to rejoin your church. Uh, uh, you've been gone. You haven't been participating. You missed uh, your family. This new season is coming. You heard the announcement. Uh, uh, things are about to start opening up and you want to be involved with your church again. I'm asking that you would write and let them know you want to recommit. You want to be involved with your church again. You want to recontinue uh, 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 your life with Christ. You, you recognize you, you, you made some errors, but you want to recommit on this day. Please write them and let them know today that you want to recommit. And lastly, I appeal for those who uh, 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 you've never known Christ. Uh, 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 you've heard about this God who is able to use anybody. You've been cast out by your family. You've been cast out uh, by your friends. You've been talked down upon. Uh, disrespected, doubted, 
uh, and denied, and you are looking for a new opportunity. You are looking to walk in the newness of life. Uh, you want to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, we have ministers that are able to make that happen. Pastor Wegar is able to make that happen for you. I want you to write and let them know that you want to be baptized on today. I thank God for you. If you're still listening, I encourage you again to share this video that somebody else uh, on these pages is able to receive this blessing today. Uh, and I'm going to pray for you, but I'm encouraging you again to come on out again tonight uh, 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 via the Berean Seven Day Adventist Church page or via this Zoom link at 6.30 p.m. as we close out our revival this evening. Shall we pray? Uh, Father in heaven, Lord, I just thank you for the good news. Uh, that you are able uh, to use us. Lord, despite of everything that we have been through, you are able to pick us up, dust us off, uh, and use us as an instrument uh, 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 to your liking, uh, your will, and your way. Lord, I'm asking that you would help those individuals that feel burdened within their hearts, Lord, to submit to you today. Lord, that they would just give it up, that they would quit fighting that which they know they need to do, Lord. I'm, 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 I'm asking that, that even now, Lord, you would make that individual restless until they give it up and decide to follow you every step of the way. Uh, Lord, I ask that you keep us until you bring us back together this evening at 6.30 p.m. In Jesus' name, amen. Ooh. All praises due to Yahweh. Hallelujah. You are yes, Lord. Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us along the way? Pastor Kenneth, the Lord use you again in a mighty way. And we're all instruments of God. But we thank God for Yeshua, Jesus, for taking us out of Gath use us as instruments in his hand beloved i know you've been blessed so i'm not going to ask if you've been blessed i'm going to ask you to unmute your devices and just begin to shout hallelujah for this raiment word this seasonal word that god has used the man of god to share with our hearts on this second leg of our revival journey this week amen hallelujah what a blessing. Amen. What a word. What a word. What a word. Thank God that He can use anything from anywhere for His glory. Amen. Beloved, this is that time of our worship experience when we ask you to partner with us in funding this ministry. We take up our tithe and our offering at the end of our service and experience together in praise, in prayer, and in the preach word. One of the things that we share with you over and over again is that as Seventh-day Adventists, we do not keep all of our monies that you give to us in partnership locally at the church. We are a group 
of sister churches. And we're grouped into conferences. So many churches in a particular area make up a conference and then so many conferences make up a union. So many unions make up a division. And all of the divisions around the world make up the world church, the general conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And this is how we allocate your givings. The tithe on that part of your envelope or wherever you are giving that says tithe goes to the conference and it's gathered in one pot, if you will. It's pulled together to remunerate, to pay the frontline workers, the pastors, teachers, Bible evangelists and instructors. But the local offering, you look on your tithe and your offering envelope, it says church budget or local offering. That is what stays at this church for us to do the ministries that we do. And many of you are faithful in your tithe, but you are very short in your offering. And if the offerings cannot facilitate our budget, it makes it difficult for us to do ministry at the local level. And so I'm pleading with you today, and I'm asking that as you give, that you not only think about that tenth, which is required of you from God, a tithe, but that you think seriously about an offering, and God doesn't put a number on the offering. He wants you to evaluate, evaluate what his love, his mercy, his grace, his protection, his peace toward you is. And you make a decision on what you are going to give. And so as you do that today, as I pray for you, I pray that the Lord will move you to be generous in your offering because we need it. We need to be able to make budget every month so we don't have to come and beg over and over again. We represent the kingdom of God. And so it is embarrassing for us to beg on God's behalf. But I know you need to know how and where your givings go. And of course, many of you, I've called those of you that are uh, I extended worshipers on Facebook from other states and you've shared with me that you've received your tax deductible receipts from the Berean church. Every amount that you give because we are a non-profit church, non-profit organization, we will give you a tax deductible receipt for you to use when you're doing your taxes at the end of the year. So I pray that God will move on your heart today to give generous. The Bible says, the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. Let us pray. Yahweh, I'm praying for that man. I'm praying for that woman, that boy, that girl, that person, Yahweh, who is committing to partner with the Berean church in the giving of their tithe, 10% whatever you bless them with and in the giving of a generous free will offering that they give with joy because you love a joyful a cheerful giver so God I pray that you will bless them with health bless them with peace protection power God bless them with jobs other streams of income God, pour back into that cover from whence they are given today. Thine is the kingdom, thine is the power. Use these funds for the furthering of the work of the gospel. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Let us bow our heads for our benediction. 
Dear Heavenly Father, once again, thank you for your word. Thank you for your manservant. God, I pray that we do not give in to the narratives of the enemy, but that we know that you can use us as instruments to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Beloved, we thank God for you. And this evening at 630 will be our final lay. This is a journey. And Pastor Cannon has been used mightily to bless us last night, this morning, and this evening we're looking forward. So share it. Tell a lot of people about it. Link in with them on Facebook. Give them the Zoom number. And we'll see you at 630 this evening. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.